There's one. It is going. It is going. It is going. The game of baseball is essentially a game of fundamentals. Every aspect of the game can be analyzed and taught. And in this series, you'll learn how to teach those fundamentals the major league way. When we're feeling a ground ball, coaches, you want to make sure that they feel as smoothly as possible. Major League Baseball represents the very highest level of baseball skill and ability. But as our professional coaches will demonstrate, the basics of the game are the same at every level. Basic fundamentals of blocking are very simple. What you want to teach your kids to do is get down on both knees. Throwing is an outfielder, you'd like to hit the cutoff man right in the chest. Once you've done that, your job is done. In addition to the fundamentals, you'll also learn simple and effective drills that are easy to master, as well as valuable insights into many of the game's finer points. Your choice of where you're going to put the ball, whether you take the sign from the glove or behind you, it's entirely up to you. You really have to emphasize to the young player the fact that their hands need to work when they hit. In the game of baseball, the teaching never stops, from youth leagues all the way to the major leagues. I'd rather have you right here. Just do, you just sort of got to stiff that one a little right. bit. Boom. Make sure that you don't get that back back in here and tight. Just, be, just keep it out front the same way. Play ball the major league way. Infielding and outfielding. This section will cover the fundamentals of infielding with Los Angeles Dodgers coach Joe Vavra. In baseball, there are four infield positions and each one has unique responsibilities. The four positions are first base, second base, shortstop, and third base. Hi, I'm Joe Vavra and now we're going to talk a little bit about fielding. We have two stances that we need to do prior to the pitch. It's the resting stance and then the ready stance. We start off with the resting stance, keep our knees shoulder width apart, our weight is balanced, we can have our hands on our knees, and we're just thinking about the situation. It's a time when we need to relax, thinking about what do I do if the ball is hitting my direction. Now, when the pitcher goes into his motion, starts to deliver the ball to the plate, we need to take, go into the ready stance. We do that by shifting our weight to the balls of our feet, our hands drop down out in front, and we watch the ball go into the viewing, the hitting area. We keep our head up and we focus on that hitting area. Now, we have the quick feet, because the weight is on our balls of our feet, and we can go in any direction as quickly as possible. While in the resting stance, the fielder should be thinking about what he will do if the ball is hit in his direction. Once the pitcher begins his windup, the fielder shifts into the ready stance. He is ready to make a play. An infielder assumes the ready stance by shifting his weight onto the balls of his feet, lowering his hands in front of him, and keeping his head up. He is able to react quickly to a ball hit in any direction. Now there's several different routes that we need to take out of the ready stance. Number one, for example, is coming straight in. When a ground ball is hit directly at an infielder, he should still move toward the ball before fielding it. Watch how this shortstop handles a slow bouncer. He moves toward the ball with quick, compact steps, watches it enter his glove, and grips it firmly before throwing. When we're feeling a ground ball, coaches, you want to make sure that they feel as smoothly as possible, that their head doesn't bounce up and down when they run, and when they go to catch the ground ball, they don't just go all of a sudden right down to the ground. So what we do that is by explaining that it's just like an airplane landing and taking off. We approach the ground ball with our head level, and then we slowly descend, into the feeling position, we watch the ball into the glove, and we come out of it slowly with our footwork. Again, the head does not go up and down, it comes nice and slowly, we land, and then we take off. Coaches, for the younger players, you may want to start them out with the one knee technique. We simply go down on one knee, feel the ball in the center of our body, bring it in with our top hand, and then come up out of it with either the crossover or the shuffle. It's a beginning point for young fielders. Beginning infielders should use the one knee technique when fielding ground balls. 
It forces them to keep the glove low and enables them to block the ball if they fail to field it cleanly. If a ground ball is hit to the infielder's immediate left or right, he should use a simple shuffle step to get to the ball. This ground ball is hit to the second baseman's right. Notice how he shuffles his feet to get in front of the ball, places his glove on the ground, uses both hands, and watches the ball as it enters the glove. He then throws the ball to first base for the out. Ozzie Smith is one of baseball's best shortstops. Watch how he shuffles to his left and fields the ball smoothly using both hands. He then grabs the ball firmly with his bare hand and makes a strong throw to first base. Now, ball's hit a little bit further, the ones I have to get to as quickly as possible. I'm gonna use a crossover step, because I'm quicker, I can get to it quicker, I can head the ball off. Again, to my right. Cross over, stay low, catch the ball in the center of the body. Now to the left, same thing. Cross over, get to the ball, absorb the ball. Catch it as smoothly as possible using soft hands. When a ground ball is hit far to a fielder's left or right, the crossover step will enable him to reach the ball as quickly as possible. On this next example, notice how the shortstop's left leg crosses over as he pivots to the right. He then plants his feet, fields the ball with both hands, and makes a strong throw. Now for the slow roller. We need to use the arc or the banana route. Cross over, make an arc towards the ball so you head it off so you get your full power of your body behind the throw. When fielding a slow roller, the infielder should take a slightly curved path to the ball. The so-called banana root will place the fielder behind the ball as he feels it, and his momentum will carry him in the right direction to make the throw. Now we're going to show you the proper technique of catching a fly ball or a pop-up in the infield. First of all, when the ball's hit, we go to the spot that we think the ball's going to land. We do not call the ball early. We wait till it gets to its apex or its peak and then we call a ball. We call off every fielder around us using the voice as loudly as possible saying, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. We use our arms and whatever motion it takes to keep that runner from inter interfering with us. The, uh, the off fielder should not be a spectator. He should back up and tell the fielder where to throw the ball. Our footwork involved in catching a pop-up is very similar to fielding a ground ball. We use a diagonal or cross over or the drop step. We want to stay away from using a back pedal. Now, let me give you a couple examples of catching a pop-up. Out of the ready stance, the ball's hit to my right. I cross over, find the peak of the ball, say, I've got it, I've got it, i got it, wave everybody off, get underneath of it, balance stance, and see the ball in the glove using soft hands. Ball to my left, same thing. Out of the ready stance, I'm ready for a ball anywhere. The ball's hit in the air. I see it, I cross over, I get behind the ball, and squeeze it into the glove. Ball over my head, the drop step. See the ball hit, I drop back, get underneath of it, watch it into the glove. I got it, I got it, I got it! On any infield pop-up, communication is vital. Anticipation is also important. An infielder must figure out where the ball will land, then move into position to make the catch. Watch how this first baseman handles this pop-up. He takes a drop step with his left foot when he sees that the ball is over his head and to the left. He then uses crossover steps to move quickly to where he thinks the ball will land and makes a two-handed catch. Whenever possible, infielders should catch pop-ups while moving forward Backpedaling can result in a loss of balance. Now, we know that the sun could be a problem when feeling a fly ball. Thus, if you do not have sunglasses, we need to use our glove to shield the sun. 
And the thing you should stress with your kids is make sure that the ball does not cross the path of the sun. You want to keep the ball in sight at all times, either using sunglasses or the glove. Let me give you an example of that. The ball's hit, I find the sun, I block it out, I keep it in the, in the path of the sun, I go get the ball, and make the catch. A bright sun can be particularly dangerous on pop-ups. Fielders should use the glove to shield their eyes. And remember, coaches, I cannot stress enough communication. Use the voice loudly. Three times, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. The off-feeler, the person who's not making the play, can say, take it, take it, take it. Don't be a spectator. In other words, make sure you're doing something to, to contribute to that play. If you're an off-feeler, make sure you're telling where the feeler to throw the ball. But the idea is communication. We do not want to have a collision, if at all possible. Once again, good communication is essential on every pop-up. Poor communication results in disasters like these. Let's take a closer look at the fundamentals of playing first base. One key to playing the infield is proper positioning when the pitch is delivered. Beginning first baseman must learn that when there is no base runner on first, they should not stand directly on the bag. Instead, they should play approximately six steps to the right of the bag and eight steps behind it. Now that we've established a comfortable position at first base for fielding, we need to see the ball hit off the bat. Now we know the general direction the ball is hit. We don't want to follow the flight of the ball. We want to go directly to the base as quickly as possible. Now we've gotten to the base as quickly as possible. We put our throwing side foot in the center of the base, giving the runner the entire baseline and base. We don't want to have an injury if we can prevent it. Now we've gotten proper balance, we square up to the throw. Throw from third base, throw from shortstop and second base. Keeping good balance. Slightly crouched, not upright, and not too low. We're ready for the throw in any direction. The weight is very much balanced. Once we see the throw in flight, then we step or stride towards that throw, extending the left or glove arm towards it. We receive the ball, not snatching at it or grabbing at it. A first baseman should determine his own range that he can go in all directions. Stepping off this way, stepping up the line, and then he has to work at it. Throw up in the air, does he come off the base? Obviously we want to catch the ball at all times, so if he has to come off the base, that's fine. If the ball's up in the air, go up and get it and come down the base. Okay? If the ball's up the line too far, he comes up, catches the ball, and maybe tags the runner as he goes by. Ball behind the base, he simply has to go get it. We'd much rather have the ball caught than to get the extra base. Watch out Gold Glove Award winner Don Mattingly receives a throw at first base. When the ball is hit, he runs to the base as quickly as possible. And since he is left-handed, he places his left foot against the inside of the base. He crouches slightly while facing the throw and then steps forward to meet the ball as it approaches. Coaches should remember that tall players have a natural advantage at first base. On high throws, they can jump to catch the ball. And on low throws, they can stretch to catch the ball before it bounces. Sometimes the first baseman will not be able to reach the ball before it bounces. Instead, he will have to feel the throw on a short hop. This is one of the most difficult plays a first baseman has to make.
on throws in the dirt, the first baseman should remain balanced and slightly crouched. He must be ready for the ball to bounce in any direction. He should not stride toward the throw until after he sees where the ball is headed. Okay, now we've got ourselves this back to the ready position. We're balanced, our foot's in the center of the base. We're ready to catch the ball in any direction it's thrown. Now, a poorly thrown ball up the line, we come off the base, we cannot reach as far as the ball is out there. So we want to come off the base, catch the ball, and tag the runner on the way by. Emphasizing the ball's in the glove, the hand's on top of the ball. And we do not want to watch his upper body or lower body. We want to watch the midsection and stay with it all the way through. Occasionally, a first baseman will have to leave the base to catch a wild throw. If the throw is to the home plate side of the base, the first baseman should catch the ball, hold it with both hands, and tag the runner as he goes by. On a tag play at first base, it is important to watch the base runner's midsection. This will make it easier to apply the tag. It is also important to stay out of the base runner's path. Instead, brush him with the tag as he goes by. If the first baseman stands directly on the bag, he risks injury in a collision. Another primary responsibility for the first baseman is holding a runner. We start with our feet with a balanced position so we can go in any direction for the ball or we can block a ball that's low. My right foot is just slightly ahead of the front of the base. My back foot or left foot is on the line. I can go in any direction. When the pitcher is on the mound area, you should be ready for a quick snap throw over to first base. I crouch slightly, I hold the glove out, I'm looking towards the pitcher. I don't want to keep my head off the pitcher and he throws it into the glove. Notice the position of Coach Vavra's feet as he holds a runner at first base. His right foot is against the bag and his left foot is on the foul line. His weight is balanced and his knees are slightly bent. Whenever a first baseman holds a runner on base, he must be ready to receive a throw and apply a quick sweeping tag. Now let's see what happens when a ground ball is hit to the first baseman. If he can't make the play himself, he tosses the ball to the pitcher who covers first base. Ideally, the ball should be tossed underhanded, chest high to the pitcher. But if the first baseman fields the ball far to his right, he may have to make an overhand throw instead. Either way, the ball should reach the pitcher before he reaches the base. If the first baseman is sure he can beat the runner to the base himself, he should grasp the ball in his bare hand, wave off the pitcher, and step on the bag. Notice how this first baseman gets the ball to the pitcher as quickly as possible. The pitcher still has time to look down and find the bag. It is also important for the first baseman's throw to lead the pitcher to the base. This pitcher is able to catch the ball without breaking stride. On this play, the first baseman nearly waits too long to make the throw. The pitcher is almost past first base when the ball finally arrives. Of course, the first baseman should make the play himself whenever possible. Don't risk making a throwing error when a throw isn't necessary. When there's a runner on first base with less than two out, the first baseman can start a double play. To do so, he throws the ball to the shortstop covering second base, then races to the bag to receive the return throw. On this play, notice how Coach Vavra must pivot his entire body before throwing to second base. That's because he throws right-handed. 
left-handed first basemen have a natural advantage on double plays. Here a left-handed first baseman starts a double play without a difficult pivot. He throws the ball to the inside of second base to avoid hitting the runner and still has plenty of time to receive the return throw. Now let's take a look at the fundamentals of playing second base. Along with the shortstop, the second baseman forms the backbone of the infield. A good second baseman should be agile with quick feet, soft hands, and an accurate throwing arm. The second baseman's positioning depends upon both the game situation and the type of hitter. He should line up somewhere on the first base side of the infield, but still close enough to second base to reach ground balls hit up the middle. He cannot play too close to second base, however, because he must also be able to field balls hit to his left in the hole between first and second. But perhaps the second baseman's most important responsibility is turning the double play. Equally exciting is a double play from second base. And we start this by doing a regular ground ball hit right at the second baseman. We call it the regular pivot on the double play. We start with a basic stance, we're catching the infield stance, we watch the ball into the glove. Now, we keep our body down, our head down, we don't come up and down, we turn and pivot on the back toe, keeping the right toe facing the target, our hips are open towards second base, we come back and we deliver a firm upper body throw. Now, some of your kids coaches will have a hard time doing that pivot. You might want to have them drop down on one knee. That'll ensure that they have proper balance. And it's per perfectly acceptable if the player steps back with the right leg. In other words, I catch the ball here and I step back here, throw the ball. You still maintain proper balance and your head doesn't come up though. It's the ball here, open up and throw the ball. Either of the methods is fine, and after they do it a few times, they're gonna get better and better, and they can just pivot and give them a good firm throw. We stay in control of our arm and our body with our feet in balance. On a double play ball hit directly to the second baseman, he should pivot quickly to his right and make a firm throw to the shortstop covering second base. Notice how this second baseman drops his right leg back while pivoting. This enables him to stay both low and balanced. Now, we make the regular double play ball with the pivot. Now what happens if the ball is to my left? Again, using this same footwork as we've talked about all along in infielding, we use a crossover or the shuffle. If the ball is just a few feet away, we use a shuffle, get in front of the ball, and then do the pivot. If it's at a longer range, we need to crossover. Crossover, go get the ball. Now rule of thumb is, if we catch the ball out here, it's going to be real hard to swing our body all the way around. There is a proper technique to that. If the ball is on an angle straight out from you to your side, and you catch the ball in that area, you just come around and get good balance and go around the clock. It's a very difficult maneuver for young players to handle, and it's one you're going to need a lot of patience with. Let me try it again. Ball hit to my side. I shuffle. I get in front of it. Come up and throw. Ball hit far range. I cross over, catch the ball, and throw. For second baseman, double play balls hit far to their left are especially challenging because their momentum is carrying them away from second base. Instead of trying to stop suddenly, they should learn to pivot counterclockwise to start the double play. Now, the ball's to my right. I either cross over or shuffle, depending upon the closeness of the ball. I'm going to use a shuffle. I feel the ball, gather another step for balance, and I feed him with a nice, firm, underhand throw, about chest high, in that area. Okay, let's try it, Steve. Ground ball. Okay. There it is. Catch the ball and under. Make sure your kids catch the ball, coaches, because they cannot do anything until they catch the ball. And most often, they'll try to go before they catch the ball. In other words, they'll try to catch it back here. Center the ball, keep a low balance, 
and come up with it. And don't recoil on the throw. Don't recoil. On a double play ball hit to the second baseman's right, he should field the ball in the center of his body and flip it underhand, chest high to the shortstop. Flipping the ball to the shortstop chest high will make it much easier for him to complete the double play. If the second baseman fields a double play ball within two or three strides of second base, he should simply step on the base himself then throw the ball to first. When turning double plays by themselves, beginning second baseman may find it easier to step on the base with their left foot. More advanced players will step on second with their right foot and use the base as a springboard to start their throw. Of course, not all double plays are started by the second baseman. When a double play ball is hit to another infielder, the second baseman should face that infielder as he approaches second base. He then catches the ball, steps on the base, and throws to first, all in one continuous motion. On any double play, the infielder who covers second base is known as the pivot man. It is the pivot man's responsibility to get the ball to first base as quickly and accurately as possible, while at the same time avoiding injury in a collision with the oncoming base runner. The second baseman's counterpart on the left side of the infield is the shortstop. Together, the shortstop and second baseman are known as a team's double play combination and are considered the keys to good defense in the infield. Like the second baseman, the shortstop's positioning depends on both the game situation and the type of hitter at the plate. The shortstop normally plays on the third base side of second base but close enough to second to reach ground balls hit up the middle. Of course, the shortstop must also be able to field balls hit to his right in the hole between second and third. The throw from the hole is the longest throw in the infield, so a good shortstop needs a strong and accurate throwing arm in addition to agility, quick feet, and soft hands. But the shortstop's most important responsibility is the same as the second baseman's, turning the double play. We start by with our feet at balance in the ready position. The ball approaches our glove. It's the same way as feeling a ground ball. We watch it in our glove. Now, instead of trying to throw against our body, we're going to open up slightly so our hips are squared with our target at second base. Open up and give them a good throw. Now, notice I stay as low as possible without bouncing my head up and down. I want to keep a good center of balance. Okay, now I'm going to have one rolled at me, directly at me. Ground ball, it's into my glove, I open up, throw the ball. As you get better and better at this, and your kids will, in time, they will start with an opened up position when they catch the ball. But to start with, we want to catch it just as if we were fielding a regular ground ball. Open up. Now, our throw should be in the upper part of the second baseman's body. We want to throw it over the base, and we don't want to throw it at the second baseman. Over the base. Stay in control and give him a good, firm throw. On a double play ball hit directly at him, the shortstop should feel the ball like an ordinary grounder. Staying low, he squares his hips toward second base and makes a firm throw. The shortstop should throw the ball directly to second base, chest high to the second baseman. This will make it easier for his teammate to complete the double play. Now, balls to hit to my left and to my right. We use the same footwork as feeling a ground ball. For example, ball hit to my right. I'll either use the shuffle or the crossover. Using the shuffle, again, I catch the ball, open up and give him a good firm throw to the upper part of his body. Use same technique with the crossover. Crossover, get in front of the ball, open up and give him a good firm throw. Chest high. Ball's to my left. It's slightly different. Crossover, now I'm in a, a distance where I'm too close to the runner to give him 
a good firm throw. I'm going to use what we call the underhand or the flip method. Ball to my left, stay low, nice easy flip throw, keeping my glove in and showing the ball all the way. Let's give you an example. Catch the ball, nice easy throw to the second baseman. On a ground ball hit to the shortstop's right, he starts a double play by squaring his hips and making a firm throw to the second baseman. But if the ball is hit up the middle to the shortstop's left, he may be too close for an overhand throw. Instead, he should flip the ball underhand, chest high to the second baseman. Now, the ground ball that is at close range to second base, there is really no need for me to flip or underhand the ball to the second baseman. I can take the ball myself and complete the double play. I do this by starting to my left, catch the ground ball, call off the second baseman by saying, I got it, I got it, I got it. Now, I want to come back in the throwing motion, and when I touch down on the base, I want to have released the ball. This way, I'll avoid the runner, and I won't risk any injury. Let me go through it. Ground ball. Catch it. I got it, I got it, I got it. Throw it. I use the base as protection. I stay behind the base to avoid the sliding runner. Often, a shortstop will be able to start a double play by himself. He should step on second base with his left foot and throw the ball to first base at the same time. Now, when you become the receiving part of the double play at the shortstop side, we want to go to the base as quickly as possible. Once we get to the base, we plant our right foot firmly in the middle of the base. We look for the throw in any direction. We square up, have a balanced stance, and we see the flight. Once the ball is in flight, we come off the base using it as a springboard to pop off the base, come and get the ball, watch it into the glove, and we complete the double play. We want to try to emphasize using two hands, but obviously some throws are going to take us away where we're going to have to use the reach. At that point, don't try to go after the ball with two hands. Look the ball into the glove as best you can and then bring it back to the hand for the quick release in the throwing motion. When turning a double play, the shortstop should use second base as a springboard. He catches the ball, steps off the base and throws in one fluid motion. It is also important for the shortstop to get to second base as quickly as possible. This gives him time to react if the incoming throw is poor. On a throw to the inside part of the diamond, again, we go quickly as possible to the base, but we use our left leg and left foot planted firmly in the base. Now, we have a balanced stance. We're ready for a throw in any direction. But once we see the ball to the inside, we should be calling for it, saying, I've got it inside, inside. Once we see that, the throw is to the inside, we spring off the base, clearing ourselves of the runner, avoiding injury, and making the completed double play. If the shortstop expects the throw on the inside part of the diamond, he should step on the bag with his left foot. He should stay clear of the base runner and throw to first to complete the double play. The fourth and final infield position is third base. In baseball, the third baseman is often the closest infielder to the batter and has to make a wide variety of defensive plays. The ideal third baseman should have good hands, a strong throwing arm, and excellent reflexes. The third baseman typically plays several strides to the left of third base and several strides behind it but his positioning always depends on both the game situation and the type of hitter. In the late innings of a close game, the third baseman often plays near the foul line to guard against extra base hits. When a bunt is expected, the third baseman should move much closer to home plate. Watch how this third baseman fields the ball with his bare hand, plants his feet, and throws, all in one fluid motion. With a runner on first base and less than two out, the third baseman should be ready to start a double play. When the ball is hit, he moves into fielding position using either the crossover or shuffle steps, fields the ball with two hands, and makes a firm, chest-high throw to the second baseman. Unlike the middle infielders, the third baseman never flips the ball underhand to start a double play. Instead, he must throw the ball to second base quickly, firmly, and accurately. 
This will give the second baseman a chance to complete the double play. Remember, most double plays begin with an ordinary ground ball. The infielder should field the ball cleanly with both hands first. Then, throw to second to start the double play. With patience and practice, your infielders might be turning double plays like these. We've already seen that each infielder has different responsibilities. Now, let's take a look at a skill that all infielders should master. Now, when we talk about tagging a sliding runner, we first of all want to square up to the infielder. Get our feet in position for the throw in any direction. But we give the base to the runner. We want to avoid all possible injury. We don't want to step in front of the base. We want to give the runner the base. We see the ball in flight. We're balanced. Watch the ball into the glove, and we sweep down through with one hand. Watch how these infielders tag base runners out at second base. They receive the ball without blocking the runner's path, then apply a quick sweeping tag. The reason we use the backhand to let the runner slide into and we make the tag is to avoid injury. If we give the ball in this position and the runner slides into it, our wrists will not give. If we get into this position and sweep through and the runner hits the backhand, then our elbow and wrist will all give with the sliding runner. Here's an up-close look at the proper way to tag a base runner. Notice how the fielder applies the tag with the back of his glove. Now let's turn ourselves around and see what happens when the throw comes from the outfield. Now, when we talk about taking a throw from the outfield and tagging the runner, we want to first square up with the outfielder. Square up with the throw wherever it is. We want to give the base to the runner. We do not want to step in the runner's base path. We want to give the base to the runner. Our backside will be to the play. First, the ball, we watch it into our glove, we catch it, then we have to turn on just our feet and swipe down through the play. Throw the inside, we catch the ball, adjust our feet, and swipe down through. On any tag play, the infielder must be careful not to block the base runner's path. Here, the infielder receives the throw behind second base, then turns to make a sweeping tag. Watch how Coach Vavra stays behind second base as he receives a throw from the outfield. By using the base as a protective device, an infielder can avoid injury and still make the play. Sometimes a base runner will choose not to slide. When that happens, the infielder should hold the ball with both hands and tag the runner's midsection as he runs by. Now let's learn some drills that will help your players become better infielders. Even Major League ball players need drills to keep their skills sharp. Ozzie Smith is one of the best shortstops in baseball history, but he still practices his fielding every day. Watch how this Major League manager gives his infielders a workout. The best way to learn how to field ground balls is through repetition and practice. Another drill you might try involves setting two gloves on the ground as boundaries, then rolling a ball from side to side between them. This will help your infielders develop lateral quickness and also stresses the importance of proper footwork, staying low, and fielding the ball with both hands.
In this section, we'll review the fundamentals of playing the outfield. In baseball, the outfield consists of three players. The left fielder, the center fielder, who's considered the captain of the outfield, and the right fielder. The fundamentals of fielding for each position are the same. Now here's coach Casey Parsons. Hi, my name's Casey Parsons with the Oakland Athletics and I'm here to talk to you about outfield play. First point I'd like to cover is stance. There's two basic stances, the resting stance and the ready stance. The resting stance, you go ahead and take your weight, distribute it evenly. If you'd like, you can put your hands on your knees. Your ready stance is when the pitcher comes set, you want to be moving your weight up onto the balls of your feet. Hands out in front and ready to anticipate any movement that you might need. Fly ball to your left, fly ball to your right, you're in a ready stance. Back to the resting stance, you can put your hands on your knees and relax. Never drop your head in between pitches. Always keep your eyes open, ready for anything that might happen in the field of play. Again, the ready stance, your weight comes to the balls of your feet and a slight flex in your knees. Hands out front, ready to go. In the ready stance, the outfielder's eyes are focused on the batter. His weight is balanced. He is ready to move in any direction. Okay, now the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is routes to the ball. The most important thing is your first step quickness. First of all, we'll take the routine fly ball. Get down in your ready position. As the ball goes in the air, drop step to make sure that you pick the ball up. You would not want to take a first step in in case the ball is over your head. You always take your first step back, pick up the ball. As you come to the ball, hands above the head, right hand behind the glove, relax, knees slightly bent, watch the ball into the glove. Catch the ball off your throwing shoulder if at all possible. Here. The second one would be a ball hit to your left or your right, and we do what we call a drop step. Again, the resting stance into the ready stance. Ball hit over your left side is a drop here. Ball hit to your right, drop step here. So a ball hit to my right side, I come to the ready stance, balls on my feet, knees flexed, boom. Very important, first step, quickness. Again, drop step to the right. It is not here, or it is not here, or across here. It's a drop step. Boom. Staying low the whole time. Once the fielder sees the ball leave the bat and fly toward him, he takes a drop step and gets in position to make the catch. He places his bare hand behind his glove and watches the ball into the glove. Here on a ball hit to his left, the outfielder drops back, keeps his body low the whole time and follows the ball all the way into his glove. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is the footwork we use on cutting off a ground ball to your left or your right. Basically, we just use what's called the crossover step. Ball hit to my left, my first motion is gonna be my right over my left. Again, ball to my right, left over right. Same way. But the most important thing in using this drop step is the angle in which you cut off the ball. A lot of times, younger players take an angle directly at the ball, do not give themselves a chance to catch the ball. The route you take is very important. Most of the time, a route on a ball hit far to your left, you need to go ahead and angle out a little bit. So as I would break to my left, instead of going straight at the ball, I angle out to cut the distance where I might be able to round that ball off. So my first movement would be, boom, here, back out, and try and cut it off, if at all possible. At times, that isn't possible, and you need to break right at the ball. That just comes from playing the outfield and gaining those instincts over a period of time. One thing I'd like to cover for uh, the coaches, for the younger player, is on a routine ground ball, I feel it's okay to drop to one knee to help block the ball. Again, for the younger player only. It gives him that confidence, the fact that if the ball takes a little bit of a bad hop, it can block, he can block the ball. 
What you should do is drop to one knee, hands out front. If the ball should actually take a bad hop, it would still hit you in the chest and you could keep the ball in front of you. As the player becomes more comfortable with fielding ground balls and becomes older, then we like to get away from that and go to the rear fielding stance right in here. Remember, when cutting off a ground ball hit hard into the outfield, instead of running in to meet the ball, where the chances of the ball getting past him are greater, the outfielder should angle out and run to this spot to cut it off. The fielder takes a drop step and then uses the crossover to cut the ball off. Watch how this fielder sprints back and to his right to cut the ball off. He then steadies himself to make a strong and accurate throw back to the infield. When there is time to get to a ground ball, the fielder should approach it in a slightly curved path, forming an arc to the ball. This way the fielder is behind the ball and has the momentum to make a strong and accurate throw. The fielder should try to anticipate where the ball will land and run to that spot. He gets behind the ball with his body low, then rises as he fields it to make the throw. By forming an arc to the ball, the fielder's momentum enables him to make a stronger throw. Next thing I'd like to talk to you about is throwing, throwing the outfield. Most important thing as far as throwing is the grip of the baseball. What we'd like you to have you do is grab the ball four seams. Not in this area here, but over the large portion. Grabbing it here and here using your wrist and what you'd like to see is the ball come off the fingers with this type of rotation. What we'd like to see is over the top rotation. What this entails is the fact that the ball has a straighter flight and when it hits the ground it skips it seems to come up. You can test yourself by when you throw the ball if you see it hit left or right you're probably cutting the ball off this way or this way. You want to come straight over the top and have the ball come right out of your fingertips right over the top. The proper technique for throwing is, number one, using the crow hop as you come up. I'll demonstrate this off of a ground ball. As you take the ball here, you come up into your crow hop, take the ball out of your glove in the four seams, rotate, closing your shoulder to the target, and if you'd like, you can keep your arm up in this area here. Rotate with the shoulder, take your crow hop, and then throw to the target with a good through, just like a pitcher would. When you pick up your target, throwing as an outfielder, you'd like to hit the cutoff man right in the chest. Once you've done that, your job is done. Let me go ahead and show you the mechanics one more time on a good throw to the cutoff man. Now one thing that's very important, when you take your crow hop, the crow hop enables you to close up. If you do not close up towards the target and you come open, it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on your throwing shoulder and you could develop some throwing discomfort in your shoulder. So it's very important that when you come up and take what we call our crow step, that we point our shoulder to the target, take that little hop, and put your momentum towards your throw. One thing that you see a lot with younger players on the crow hop is as they take the crow hop, they want to pop up. Remember, Make your momentum go to your throw, not up, but through your target. On this hit to left field, notice how the fielder points his shoulder toward his target as he makes the throw. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is the fly ball. There's two types of fly balls. The basic fly ball with nobody on base, and the one where there might be a possible throw involved with a man tagging on base. The first, come to a ready stance. As the ball's hit, you take your drop step, you get behind the ball. As the ball's coming down, you get your legs flexed, you get your hands up, you try and catch the ball over your throwing shoulder with your off throwing hand behind the glove and watch the ball into the glove. Notice my legs are flexed and my weight is on the balls of my feet. Watch this outfielder approach a fly ball. His legs are flexed, his weight is on the balls of his feet, 
He uses two hands and he catches the ball over his throwing shoulder. Remember, always use two hands. The second fly ball is a one where there could be a possible tag situation. In that one, we want to get behind the ball. It's very important that we get behind the ball and get our momentum going through to have a possible throw. In this situation, again, we get in our good ready stance. We're ready, get our hands out in front. As the ball's hitting, we pick it up. We drop back, pick up the ball, and stay behind the ball. You wait behind the ball, as the ball comes down, we start forward, and as the ball would hit, say here, we come through it and catch it at this point here and follow through. So we have momentum going to the bag we want to throw to. Notice how this outfielder stays behind the ball as it comes down. He's moving forward as he makes the catch and has the momentum to make a strong and accurate throw. With all fly balls, I want to mention one point that's very important as an outfielder. When you start running after a fly ball, if you do not stay on the balls of your feet, your eyes tend to bobble. At that point, it's very hard to follow the ball bouncing like this. Outfielders take care of this by running on the balls of their feet as shock absorbers, and it keeps your eyes from bouncing. So again, if you're having problems picking up a fly ball that you're running for, you're probably not running on the balls of your feet. Another thing, too, when a fly ball is hit, never drift. There are certain things such as wind and different weather conditions that could cause a ball to drift, and you wouldn't want to be caught at the last second not being able to be in front of the ball. So it's very important that you run to the spot where you anticipate the ball is going to land and get underneath it and get set. On this fly ball, the outfielder quickly goes to the spot where he anticipates the ball will land and sets himself to make the catch. It is very important to get to the spot where the ball will land. Drifting can cause loss of balance. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is ground balls. Two basic types of ground balls. Ground ball with nobody on base and obviously with a runner on base where there might be a possible throw. An outfielder is the last line of defense. With nobody on base, it's very, very important that you knock that ball down. In this situation, we just want to use a good infielder stance, come in, get your rear down on the balls of your feet, look the ball into your glove. Very simple. But the most important thing is, is to come up in a ready position and stop that runner from advancing to second base. I would basically, as I come in, charge to the ball. Do not let the ball come to you, but be under control. Under control the last 10 feet, come set, and as if you look the ball into the glove, turn and get the ball in as quickly as possible, trying to hit the cutoff man right in the chest. Very important to get the ball in as quickly as possible. Once you've done that, you've done your job as an outfielder. As this ground ball gets through the infield, the center fielder charges the ball, following it all the way into his glove. He bends his knee and quickly comes up ready to throw the ball back to the infield. With nobody on base, it is important for the outfielder to get his body in front of the ball and make a quick throw to keep the batter at first base. The second ground ball I'd like to talk to you about is one with a man on base, where the outfielder will have a possible throw with a man trying to advance. In this situation, we cannot afford to come in and stop and stop our momentum. We want momentum going through the ball, coming up, making the throw to that bag. This is done by charging the ball again as we do on with nobody on base to shorten up the distance. But when we field the ball, we field the ball off to the side here. The most important things is legs bent and head up. Too many times we find young players put their head down and do not see the ball into the glove. Watch the ball into the glove here, come up, you rotate on your right foot, turning your shoulder to the target and make what we call a crow hop. Here, hop and throw.
Notice how the fielder's momentum carries him through the throw. He fields the ball off to the side, then rotates on his right foot, turning his front shoulder to the target. Sometimes the fielder will not have the time to get his body's momentum behind the ball, but the rest of the throwing fundamentals stay the same. He plants his feet, watches the ball into the glove, comes up and turns his shoulder toward the target. Then he makes a strong throw to the base to get the runner. Remember, the more momentum a fielder has, the stronger the throw will be. Now, let's look at the cutoff play, the relay system that gets the ball from the outfielder to the cutoff man to the target base as quickly and accurately as possible. Note that on a cutoff play, the fielders are aligned with the target base and they must communicate that's with each one, other. One. Right there. Cut three. The fielder at the base instructs the cutoff man where to stand, so he is able to relay the throw as quickly and efficiently right as possible. Cut three. All three fielders should form a straight line from the outfield to the base. Left, left one, right there. Once the cutoff man sees where the ball is hit, he turns to the outfielder and raises his arms to make a target. He cuts off the ball and throws it to the base. Unless the cutoff man is told by the fielder at the target base to cut the ball off, he will let the ball go through. When the batter hits a single and there are no runners on, the outfielder may throw directly to second base. There's no need to cut the throw off since the distance to the base is short. On a ball hit all the way to the fence, it's nearly impossible for the outfielder's throw to reach the base directly. The cutoff man should come to the shallow part of the outfield to relay the throw. It's very important for the outfielder to know where the cutoff man is. On this play, even though the fielder is running hard and cannot see the cutoff man, he throws to the correct spot and is able to get the runner out. It is also essential that the cutoff man knows the situation here, the outfielder tries to get the runner at home plate, but the catcher tells the cutoff man to reroute the ball to third base and get the out there. Now, let's take a look at some outfielding drills. The most common drill involves hitting fly balls with a long, thin bat called a fungo. The fungo bat makes it easier to control the speed and the path of the ball. Okay, coaches, we're going to show you a couple drills to make your players better outfielders. The first drill we're going to show you is the ground ball drill. This drill can be used either with a fungal or you could roll the ball, whatever's easier for you. It's very important for coaches to communicate with players during each drill. This is the best way to instill the proper techniques and prevent players from developing poor habits. The advice and comments that coaches make throughout each drill serve as a consistent reminder to the players about what to do and what not to do. Come through it now. Just keep coming through it. Stay low and come through.
This is the fly ball drill. Again, communicate with your players. Get in a set position now. Try and get right underneath it. Don't time it. Go right to the ball and get underneath it. Here is a variation of the fly ball drill, which focuses on practicing the drop step. Uh huh. Okay, now if you can stop and get in front of it, set up and catch it. This drill helps fielders practice the drop step when catching a fly ball, dropping back to the left, using the crossover step, and following the ball into the glove. The same applies to a ball hit to the fielder's right. Take a drop step, cross over, run on the balls of the feet, and watch the ball into the glove. Coaches can use this hat drill to practice throwing techniques. By throwing as close to the hat as possible, fielders go. will learn the go. proper release point for throws and how to bounce a ball into a base. Use those legs now. When you anticipate that ground ball, use those legs. Stay low. Coaches should also stress communication in the outfield at all times to avoid collisions. One fielder must call for the ball by yelling, I've got it, I've got it, while the off fielder gives way. This is how communication works. Here, the right fielder calls for the ball while the center fielder comes over and backs up the play, just in case the ball gets by. Here we go. Here is how you can practice communication among outfielders. All right, good. Okay, I want a lot of communication. I want to hear you yelling. Let's go. With two outfielders wide apart, hit the ball between them. Make sure they call for it. Okay, off-fielder now. The off-fielder anticipate he's going to miss that ball. Just don't run behind him. Be ready to field the ball. Here we go. I got it. I got it. In baseball, there's nothing more graceful than a great catch in the outfield. 